one of the most well-known watch brands in the world, Rolex was founded in 1905 by Hans Wilsdorf and his brother-in-law, Alfred Davis. The brand was first created in England and then relocated to Switzerland. It's amazing that a German orphan named Hans Wilsdorf was so important to the company's success. Though he was neither English nor Swiss, he and Alfred turned Rolex into the multi-billion dollar business that it is today. Born in Comeback, Northern Bavaria, in 1881, Hans Wilsdorf was the middle child of a prosperous middle-class family of three. At the age of 12, disaster struck despite the fact that his parents maintained an ironmongery in Comeback and his grandparents were well off. In a short time, Hans's parents both died, leaving him and his siblings orphans. After assuming custody, their aunt and uncle enrolled them at a Coburg boarding school. With Hans providing the idea and Alfred providing the financial backing, their partnership allowed Rolex to become a well-known brand throughout the world. The founders of Rolex overcame the difficulties of orphanhood and left a legacy in the luxury watch industry. Their success story is a testament to their tenacity and resolve. Hans had a terrible time at the boarding school, even though their goal in sending the children there was to guarantee a quality education. In spite of his discontent, he concentrated on his studies and improved his reading, writing, and speaking English, skills that would come in very handy in the future. Hans, who had gone through a lot of bad years, left school at the age of 19 in search of a better life. He relocated to Switzerland's La Choc de Fonds, which at the time was regarded as a leading hub for watchmaking. With this step, he officially entered the watch industry. Hans got unique experience in Le Chaux de Fonds, where he immersed himself in the complexities of watchmaking for the first time. He started off as an employee of a pearl dealer before landing a job at Kumo Corton, a developing watch company. Hans had never made a watch before, but his proficiency in reading and writing English made him valuable because it allowed him to manage letters from both the American and British empires. Hans, who worked for Kuno Corton, developed an obsession with the accuracy of watch movements. Hans believed it was time to start his own watchmaking business after working for Kuno Corton. After relocating to London, he connected with his brother-in-law, Alfred Davis, who proved to be a good project partner. In 1905, they established Wilsdorf and Davis together. When Hans and Alfred first started their business, they were 24 years old, they imported watch parts, put them in British cases, and sold them to jewelers. The two realized they could create their own brand after this early success. They were able to secure the name Rolex after three years. Hans wanted his name to be brief, simple to remember, and pronounced correctly in all languages. Despite starting in London, the company swiftly grew by setting up shop in Switzerland. Hans saw the change in men wearing timepieces on their wrists in the early 1900s and was now dreaming of an exquisite, robust, and accurate wristwatch. But unlike pocket timepieces, which were protected by clothing, he pointed out that wristwatches were subjected to more extreme weather. Seeing room for improvement, Hans set out to reinvent the wristwatch, imagining it to be a sophisticated accessory that would also be dependable in terms of accuracy and longevity. Hans realized the potential in wristwatches, even though they were regarded as delicate women's fashion accessories at the time. Taking note of the shortcomings that were already there, such as a lack of accuracy, Hans worked tirelessly to make his watch movements better. In 1910, Rolex became the first wristwatch to acquire the Swiss Certificate of Chronometric Precision, a testament to the success of his work. Hans's brilliance went beyond creating intricately designed timepieces. It also included astute marketing. He was skilled at showcasing his innovations to the public in the most captivating ways, which resulted in a number of odd pranks during the ensuing decades. With the release of the watertight oyster casing in 1926, the adventure got underway. This creative case was made to be dust and waterproof. Hans offered one to Mercedes Glitz, a professional swimmer from Britain who was trying to be the first female swimmer to cross the English Channel to see how well it worked. Hans made her wear the genuine oyster during her valiant achievement. 
Mercedes' attempt to break the record was sadly unsuccessful because of the unfavorable weather. She was escorted back to shore on a vessel after more than 15 hours in the frigid waters separating France and Great Britain. Her Rolex, astonishingly, held true to time even after being submerged in chilly waters for hours. The difficult swim received a lot of praise, and to increase awareness of the event, Rolex immersed the oyster and fish tanks in storefront displays to highlight its waterproof capabilities. Moreover, Hans Wilsdorf deftly took advantage of other significant occasions to promote his goods. When pilots took off over Mount Everest for the first time in 1933, their effectiveness in the air was demonstrated by the Rolex timepieces they wore. Two decades later, in 1953, Sherpa Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary were the first people to reach the summit of Mount Everest while donning an oyster perpetual. In the 1950s, Rolex descended into the murky depths of the ocean, not satisfied with only scaling the highest mountain on the planet. The sport of deep sea diving was becoming more and more popular, and in 1960, the Trieste was lowered to the lowest point on Earth. With only a Rolex deep sea special fastened to the outside of the ship, this historic dive was the fifth and deepest plunge. After the world was suitably impressed, the most unlikely personality started to appear on screen wearing Rolex watches. Hans Wilsdorf's calculated actions in linking Rolex to noteworthy accomplishments in climbing, deep sea research, and aviation cemented the brand's reputation for dependability and accuracy, drawing in a wide clientele from a range of backgrounds. What are the commonalities between Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, James Bond, Warren Buffett, the 14th Dalai Lama, and Pope John Paul Io? A passion for Rolex watches unites them all. Even ardent opponents of capitalism and communist leaders like James Bond and Warren Buffett seem to have an appreciation for Rolex, which may come as no surprise to some. It's important to realize that, despite its history of leading the way in technological innovation, Rolex wasn't the same kind of status symbol back in the 1960s as it is now. For the most of its existence, a Rolex was seen as a useful instrument as opposed to an ornamental piece of jewelry. Furthermore, Rolex watches were not as outrageously costly back then as they are now. For example, in 1957, you would have paid $180 or a stainless steel submariner date. After accounting for inflation, this amounts to almost $1,500 in modern currency. Nonetheless, the identical model currently carries a price tag above $10,000. The change in pricing and perception can be linked to a crisis that Rolex was able to leverage to its benefit. In the years 1970 to 1980, the Swiss watch industry experienced what is known as the quartz crisis. It's interesting to note that quartz technology was becoming more popular in Japan during this time. Most people refer to it as the quartz era, which started on Christmas Day of 1969 when Japanese watchmaker Seiko unveiled the Astron, the first quartz wristwatch ever made. It was an enormous hit, and plenty of other companies quickly adopted it. Sports watches shifted from using a mechanical movement to one that ran on batteries. The Swiss watch industry saw a sharp downturn as a result of these quartz watches' superior accuracy and cheaper production costs. The shift from mechanical to quartz timepieces occurred nearly instantly around the world, endangering Swiss watchmakers. When Swiss watch firms, like Rolex, realized they couldn't match Asian watchmakers on pricing, they decided to differentiate themselves by showcasing their legacy, status, and craftsmanship. Rolex made significant investments in creating the upscale brand image that they are currently recognized for during the 1980s. Back when flying was still considered a luxury pastime, Rolex displayed their timepieces in airports and signed sponsorship agreements with sailing, tennis, golf, equestrian sports, and the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. These marketing strategies allowed Rolex to maintain its appeal in the face of the quartz crisis turning their timepieces from functional instruments into sought-after pieces of art. The brand is a prime example of working on your reputation first, letting it do the talking, and then letting it do the work, 
because its prestige is based on creativity, precision, and functionality. Please leave your opinions in the comments section below. If you're interested in horology, please let us know what more fascinating aspects you believe this movie should have covered. Check out our channel if you're in the mood for more motivational business tales.